So welcome to a slightly unusual version of the uh, Nigna Day slot today. We are going to um, have a little talk about Moshe Berigovsky himself today. So I thought I'd start with Enigma of the Day. Um, and I'm cheating a bit because I want everything to be very directly related. I'm going to steal somebody else's. Um, and this one is one that's supposed to be played uh, in a few weeks' time by Ariane. And so... So this is a tune, uh, it's number 47, it's just called Ning, and it uh, is one that Berigovsky himself learns as a child from his father, and he recorded himself playing it for the uh, Tish uh, volume. So I'll just play it through for you now. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming along. Um, I thought I'd talk today about uh, Moshe Berigovsky himself, and uh, that was a melody that he adopted, he says adopted, as a child from his father um, in the town of Makarov, Kiev province, which is where he was, um, where he was born and lived as a child. Um, so he uh, was born into the family of a Melamed, um, a Heide teacher, a Jewish parochial sort of primary school teacher. And he had a bit of a musical upbringing. I'm going to see if I can bring up a picture of him for you now. Um, and here he is. Here he is. Here he is. Okay. Right, here he is, Moshe Berigovsky. And um, just to give you an idea of wh where it was that he was living, it's about 60 kilometers from Kiev. That's where Makarov is. Um, and he, as a child, participated, uh, he was in a, a synagogue choir. And when he went, uh, when they moved to Kiev in 1905, the family, he actually uh, started taking cello lessons and he also studied um, music theory. But uh, he, I think it had a profound effect on him, actually, the upbringing that he had there, um, because he mentions in certainly in the Tishnigan book having learned uh, melodies as a child he uses melodies that he's collected from local musicians there and um, here's a picture of a klezmer band there uh, around about the 1890s and this is from the latest edition of um, of it says fist violinist I must tell somebody about that little uh, typo there <laughs> it's from the most recent edition of uh, Berigovsky's uh, instrumental Jewish folk music book and uh, he, as I say, went on, went on to um, study in Kiev. He did cello and composition at Kiev Conservatoire. 
and he then also went to the St. Petersburg Conservatory um, to study composition. And that was 22 to 24, 1922 to 24. In the meantime, he worked as a vocal coach in Jewish orphanages. He conducted choirs and he founded and directed a music school for the Jewish Culture League. Um, then from about 1928 onwards, he went on to have a very illustrious career as the head of the musical folklore section uh, of the Instru Institute for Jewish Proletarian Arts of the Academy of Sciences of the Ukrainian SSR. He was a researcher, he was head of various things, he was a teacher, um, <clears throat> he, he, um, and he, in 1929, he took over the Department of Musical Folklore in the Kiev Institute, and by 1934, he was also part of the board, um, <clears throat> the presidium of the Institute, as head of the folklore section. Um, but most importantly, from our point of view, from 1927 to 1947, he made ethnographic trips collecting secular Jewish music. Um, and his works make up the largest, most carefully notated collection of its kind in pre-war um, and early post-war Europe. We wouldn't know what we know about Klezmer today, uh, including what was played, who played it, how they played it, where and why, without the work of Moshe Berigovsky. Um, he made 2,000 field recordings on 700 uh, phonograph cylinders during his expeditions. He also catalogued phono cylinders from the archives of the Ansky uh, expedition, Ansky expedition, and the Engel and Kieselgoff collections, which were from 1912 to 1914. And here you can see a picture of Kieselgoff um, collecting in the field with his informants in a village somewhere. Um, he had that phonograph machine. Um, and he also uh, made uh, transcriptions uh, for many of uh, the melodies and the collection contains about 4,000 transcriptions. He prepared a five volume work on several aspects of Ashkenazi music, including revolutionary and worker songs, folk songs, Hasidic wordless songs, Nigunim, which is the um, volume that we're working on in this project, klezmer music and the Purim uh, Spiel folk drama. That's uh, the plays that were done, the folk plays that were done around Purim. And he's credited with pioneering many concepts and many theories. Um, for example, the Israeli musicologist Joachim Brown says he uh, pioneered the concept of the inadequacy of musical notation for indicating the unique manner of singing dif uh, of different peoples, folk music basically it's impossible to notate it uh, the assimilatory potential of each national culture um, i.e how music moved into those cultures um, and the fact of judaization of non-jewish music in the milieu of traditional jewish music musicians so this is ha um, taking in uh, non-jewish tunes and making them jewish and there's a really nice story about berikovsky in in 1928 uh, he gave a talk at the Folklore Commission of the Ukrainian Academy of Sciences and he sang the Hebrew prayer, uh, a, a Hebrew prayer to a well-known Russian melody, uh, but in a moderate tempo and in the cantorial style of singing, although he didn't change a single note. And uh, afterwards, they were unanimous in identifying um, this as a typical Jewish melody. And they were really embarrassed when um, he told them the truth. Um, I thought uh, I'd show you this picture. It's another Klezmer band, um, which we'll come to in a second. Uh, some things that I've noted um, as I go along, I've, this was put together quite quickly, so it's just a few observations. Um, Berigovsky is credited with the coining the term Klezmer for the music, the repertoire that we play in the genre. Um, he noted that instrumental Jewish tunes were taken into vocal genres, so it's not just for example, Nigun in the songs without words going into the instrumental genre. It's the other way around that uh, they started singing the melodies used for dancing, for example. Uh, he noted that the flute and the clarinet had the same name when the clarinet was first introduced uh, in the genre. Folkloric scales, he, he definitely pioneered uh, studying of folkloric scales. And he also talks about um, uh, the correspondence of the modes with the mood of the music, particularly in the Tishnagun book, in his introduction. And that uh, reminds me of the exploration of um, when you talk about different musical temperaments, tunings, uh, there's quite a lot of contemporary discussion about how that, that affects um, the colour of the keys that you get at the other end. 
Um, he also points out that not only Hasidim were responsible for niganim, uh, it's not only ultra-Orthodox Jews, although they took it to a whole new level, the composition and uh, employment of these uh, wordless tunes to take you to a new spiritual realm. Um, he, gave, he categorized Jewish dances um, and the melodies used for them, which has been incredibly helpful in rediscovering the, the literature. And he helps us to understand, really, back to the 17th century, the chronology of the music, the instrumentation, the cultural application. For example, what wedding rituals were, what they were at his point in time, and the klezmer's place in society. Now, a really uh, important uh, point in the history of Jewish uh, ethnomusicology, if you like, is started around 1900 where people started going collecting in the field um, but in 1908 the Society for Jewish Folk Music was established in St Petersburg and there were two major figures Kieselhoff who we saw out there collecting in the field and Ansky who I mentioned and this 1912 to 1914 was a really um, seminal moment in that they went out and started recording people started asking them questions they, I think they had 2,000 questions or maybe it was 2,000 respondents um, and Kieselhoff was very interesting. He actually uh, came from Vilnius, and uh, I won't say much about him, but he was also the son of uh, a Melamed, and he taught maths to Yesha Heifetz. There you go, that's one of his claims to fame. Uh, so here's uh, Berogowski uh, when he was on the board. He's, he's the second one from the left, and uh, you can see that they're all there they're all men those were the days uh, in 1927 he organized a commission for the study of Jewish folk music under the auspices of the Ukrainian Academy of Sciences where he uh, had a department and uh, chiefly in the 30s he used his position to launch major fieldwork efforts to collect old time and Syria, uh, Soviet era music and he stored it in the archives prepared essays anthologies and planned this five volume series um, so I thought I would also um, play a, you an mp3 of something that he recorded in 1929 and um, this is a melody it's a good tune um, let me see, sorry. So here's MP3. <laughs> He got it from his uncle, he says. Um, he also um, collected a tune from um, the uh, guy I showed you, Berman, uh, whose picture I showed you a little while back. So um, you can't really talk about Berogowski without talking about the context he was working in. And um, he was the main scholar and one of the chief ideologues of Yiddish music in the Soviet Union. And he, he did also record the musical folklore of other communities from time to time. And he faced many dangers and really had to negotiate many political minefields. He repeatedly emphasized the disjuncture between traditional Jewish musical practices and uh, the cultural realities of the Soviet system. And uh, one of the examples, well, so just to say, after the revolution, obviously uh, music became part of the ideological struggle. And initially there was official state support for Yiddish culture as part of the Soviet uh, nationalities policy, which was strong in the 20s and 30s and then declined. And Jewish folk music was co-opted and used at the official level and was still performed, of course, in less official contexts, such as weddings, 
um, restaurants, unannounced encores at public concerts. Um, and the revolution split the Society for Jewish Folk Music in three different geographical directions. In 1918, the one in St. Petersburg, the flagship um, one, was shut down. And by the early 20s, um, the political and cultural focus of Jewish life had shifted to Moscow, where a new version was formally organized in 1923 and continued with government uh, recognition and support to 1929. Uh, Berogovsky worked in the Ukraine, and of course there was still a Yiddish culture there in the 20s and 30s, uh, so he could really understand how the, and also from his per, um, personal experience, understand how the Jewish spiritual culture was inextricably connected with the um, depths of religion and national history, how the Jewish musical spiritual culture. But of course the official view um, was that characteristics of Jewish music are in themselves the product of a clerical bourgeois class that exploits ordinary Jews. So, for example, the many improvised solos, which were the height of the Jewish musical um, experience, and, you know, the top musicians played these enormously improvised solos uh, that were really quite spiritual and came out of the Jewish uh, spiritual tradition rather than playing for the dances. And that was now no longer a good thing. Um, the happy tunes, you know, in the major for the ordinary folks were the good things. And he's sort of uh, supported the understanding of the relationship between synagogue modality and klezmer, um, but only in his early publications up till about 1929. And by the Stalinist era, um, he retreated for the political reasons. Um, so he didn't really want to stress the connection between the non-dance repertoire of the klezmer and the Hasidic milieu. Um, so he really needed, to, I'm, I'm working from various different people's um, uh, wonderful treatises and things here, and I will give a list of my sources at the end. Um, he, he needed to present the klezmer as um, representative of the toiling Jewish masses rather than as a parasite working for the Jewish oligarchy and Hasidic courts. So, you know, the Jews' everyday bread and butter wasn't really um, something that you could talk about. Um, and then another example is really the Chosidal as a dance. Um, it's possible that non-Orthodox Jews might have parodied the Hasidim in their dance forms, um, but he pre presented this um, solo um, uh, expression of dance, um, as which was kind of linked to synagogue modality and feeling, um, and he characterized it as grotesque, again, sort of, downplaying that element of, of the uh, music. In a 1934 article, he actually denounced the earlier collectors of Jewish folklore, including Ansky, and uh, he accused them of being either clerical Zionists or petit bourgeois liberal populists. And he, but he did approve of Shmuel Lehman, who in 1921 published the first anthology of Jewish workers and revolutionary songs. Uh, from the 1905 period, and it was called Arbeit und Freiheit, Labour and Freedom. Um, but the politics inevitably sort of caught up with him. In 1935, the Institute, um, which actually had, by then had 100 workers, was reduced to a cabinet with a mythal assistance. Um, and in 36 to 38, Stalin's show trials and purges, the first lot, really got going. Um, so he had to sort of tread ultra carefully, and he did manage to navigate this period. Um, and one of the things that came out of that particular time uh, was 1937 to 38, there was um, an ensemble set up called the uh, State Ensemble of Jewish Folk Musicians of the Ukrainian SSR. And uh, there were at least two incarnations when the leadership changed and they had to pretend they hadn't existed before. Um, but Berogovsky was definitely, there's a whole article by Jeffrey Wallach about how Berogovsky was definitely part of the formation and uh, providing the repertoire for this ensemble. And they do have a very folky feel, but the second time around when they reformulated, they, it was much more sort of composed and because that was what you were supposed to do that by that point, it wasn't about folk music. It was about the evolution of Jewish folk music into an art form and being composed and tamed. Um, Berogovsky's uh, work was interrupted by World War II, uh, as you might expect, and they were uh, evacuated in 1941 to the Central Asian region 
of uh, Bakhiria, Bash, Bashkiria. Anyway, he did. A, he, I, I had a, a map of how far away it is. Uh, it's a long way away from Kiev, and he really didn't have much idea of what was going on uh, as the Germans over on the Ukraine. But uh, he went and did some field work on local music there uh, when he was evacuated. In um, 1944, he went to Moscow and defended his dissertation, his PhD. And uh, the work on the Jewish instrumental music formed the basis. And some of the limitations of his research were pointed out as part of his uh, uh, viva, I guess we'd call it. Um, one, <laughs> one person said uh, it was very difficult because there weren't any metronome markings um, to, to clarify the nature of the piece. You, can't, you don't know what speed it's supposed to go and therefore how it feels. And this is something that he um, rectified in subsequent publications. And we do have metronome markings, although at one point he says he forgot um, that they're based on a, a reminiscence of when the music was collected or the tunes he knew because he could, didn't have access to the phonograph uh, recordings when he was actually transcribing them and making the metronome markings. So anyway um after world war ii he he returned to kiev well not just not yet at the end but in 1944 um and he found that the archive had been carried off to germany by trophy hunters um de despite uh, this, that setback he embarked on new expeditions that took him uh various places in southwest ukraine and um to the central ukraine Ukrainian area of Vinitsa, and this was in 44 and 45. And Berogovsky's daughter, I've got pictures to show you of these people, but I can't bear the, um, the whole screen sharing thing. It's a bit slow, so I'll show you at the end if you like. Um, his daughter, who had been born in 1929 and uh, became one of the champions of his work and wrote articles about it, uh, although she was very eminent in her own field uh, in France, which is where she ended up living. Um, she recalled the excursions in 44 and 45 um, in a memoir of her father reporting um, from a few prisoners who managed by a miracle to stay alive. He recorded 70 songs created and performed by those destined to die. And she also um, cited compelling passages from her father's own account of the journeys. The more we learned of the horrific and inhumane conditions of life in the camps and ghettos, the more difficult it was to imagine the possibility of the existence of song in this reality. Um, nevertheless, uh, even the Chernovsky expedition provided us with enough material to conclude that songs, as well as art in general, occupied a prominent place in the life of the camps and ghettos. Um, he tried to get this work published, but he, he couldn't. Uh, the politics wouldn't allow it. In 1948, Stalin's anti-Semitic purges uh, began, and in 1949, the department was shut down. He himself wasn't arrested until 1950, but at that point he was sent to uh, Teshet in the Irkutsk region, uh, where he was for five years till 1955. Um, according to Soroko in 1992, the um, charges against Berogovsky were cosmopolitanism and Jewish nationalism, uh, and also anti-Soviet agitation, according to his daughter. Um, Citing, they cited Ukrainian documents. Um, it depends what you read. There's different chronologies and slightly different uh, explanations of the charges. Um, anyway, in 19, uh, he was rehabilitated, and uh, his daughter reported that he that Shostakovich intervened. He was a great admirer, apparently, of Berogovsky's work. He take taken interest in Jewish music and started incorporating it in his work, um, and. So Shostakovich intervened to obtain his rehabilitation in 1956. And in 1960, there's a letter uh, from Shostakovich to Berogovsky expressing his high regard and asking his advice, advice on musical matters. Um, so he spent the remainder of his life preparing his collections of Yiddish folk songs and Purim Spielen for publication. He died in 1961. Um, at that point, uh, none of his... Um, very little of his material had been published. I've got, I do have a couple of things to show you, so I am going to switch you over. 
So it was thought for a long time that the archives had been lost, but uh, his, uh, Berigovsky's daughter Ada says, when in 1950, after li the liquidation of the Jewish culture cabinet, my father was arrested, all his manuscripts were taken, and then after the end of the investigation, they weren't destroyed for some reason, and they allowed my mother to take them home. Um, and then Ada, the daughter, entrusted them to Izali Zentovsky in St. Petersburg, having transferred them um, from Kiev. Oh, who then uh, gave them to somebody else, having transferred them from Kiev in 1966 with the approval of the Berogovsky family. I mean, it depends what you read. Again, it's slightly nebulous uh, how they came back to light. But nevertheless, they are definitely uh, in circulation now. Um, and with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 and the subsequent opening of formerly closed archives, it was discovered that the entire archive, not just the notes, uh, but about a thousand wax cylinders that were still playable, original sounds, the collection of uh, Kies uh, Kieselhoff and um, Ansky, and all this music and transcriptions were actually there in Kiev. And there are um, also sources still in St. Petersburg. So there's, there's material around. It's been quite difficult to um, get to in some ways. I tried when I was on a Klezma cruise down the river Dnieper from Kiev to Odessa in 2007, but I didn't manage to get in and actually see the material. Um, but it remains a bit of a dream of mine. In the meantime, material has been made available, including um, manuscripts of the five um, books, which were available from... Uh, the Kiev Library uh, on disc uh, as PDFs and quite a lot of the music as well um, one of the that track I played you earlier is available and it's so it's all fascinating there's a lot more available and hence this project was possible because I had the manuscript of the Tishnigunin book um, there have been various projects trying to bring the uh, material into wider circulation apart from publications um, the main book that's been published is the uh, instrumental music book. It's had three or four editions now, and um, the current edition was uh, produced in 2015, um, and it builds on work of Mark Slobin and Michael Alpert um, from previous editions, and um, also Bob Rothstein. Uh, to bring you this very fine volume, which includes a whole lost chapter. So it's, it's a wonderful thing. It's got several hundred tunes in it, and um, that's just a selection. As with all the books, he's selected the things that uh, he liked best or thought represented uh, a good survey of the material. Um, so projects that have happened in recent years, uh, Joel Rubin's Berogovsky's Wedding, uh, Alicia Spiegel's The Berogovsky Suite, which is the development of the music, um, historian Anna Sternschiss uh, at the University of Toronto with Soy Kolarenko, who's um, a Moscow-based singer and New York, and a uh, Toronto-based producer, Dan Rosenberg, did a show called Yiddish Glory, which used some of this material that was collected in 1944 and 45. Um, and now I'm trying to get uh, some of this material from the um, Tish Nigunim book out there by getting Klezma fiddlers from around the world to play it here during our lockdown in 2020. Um, so I thought I would conclude by showing you those pictures, by sharing the screen one last time. And just showing you the pictures that I did manage to put together in a patient fashion. Um, yes, yeah, so this was where he was evacuated to. It wasn't. It was where he was um, exiled during uh, 50 to 55. It's 5,000 miles away, you can see. I, it astounds me, these journeys that people made. Incredible. Um, this is the daughter, Ada, who died in 2011, I think. Uh, this is the front cover of the 1934 edition that I mentioned. 
uh, it's volume one <laughs> and it had a, a mixture of, of tunes I think um, so this is the Russian transliterated version I think possibly the Yiddish transliterated version I'm not sure and this is the front cover of the Purim Spiel um, this so he it was a real theme of Berogovsky's in his life he was very devoted to this idea of the Purim Spiel um, and he came back to it again and again he put it in order he, he went around collecting these and he collected seven or eight or I think and he's painstakingly notated there's a lot of recitative there's not a lot of great tunes but it's telling this story about how I used to save the Jews and um, his his uh, daughter and uh, subsequent generations went to a lot of trouble to prepare this beautiful edition which um, I borrowed for a while from Merlin Shepherd. Um, he kindly lent it to me. I think it's green, if I remember rightly, but I took a, a copy of the front cover. Um, and this is something that's very special because nothing else really like it exists apart from perhaps something like the Oba Ramagal plays, um, this folk um, re repetition of a story, um, although I'm sure other people <laughs> will have examples, but certainly in the Jewish um, calendar, it's a very special thing. And... Uh, there, are, there hasn't been a, an English language edition of this volume, as there hasn't of the Tish Nigunim. Um, oh, and I was just going to show you also the front cover of the current edition, which I showed you anyway. Um, so I thought I would end with another Nigun from um, his... Stop sharing. Um from the instrumental collection but it was also from an earlier collection um it's a uh, called ahavaraba uh, which is the name of a prayer and we also use it as the um designation for a mode one of the main modes the one that sounds like this <laughs> Yeah, so it's in two sources, and it is in his uh, Jewish instrumental folk music book. So I'll just play that for you now. It's, a, it's like in Ning. if anybody has anything that they'd like to ask or comments uh, corrections <laughs> statements Sandra um, I'm just curious how did you come up with the idea for the Klezmer Fiddle Nigunim project um, 
it was it was sort of a bit coincidental because I put up, I have, um, I'm Kurt Bjorling's European agent for his books. Every so often he'll send me 10 or 15 and I'll um, advertise them and, and get them around to people in Europe because otherwise it's, you know, one, one in the postage time. And so I put a post on Facebook saying, I've got these copies. If anybody wants one, now's a good time to start to study them <laughs> now that we've got nothing else to do. And, um, uh, I was talking with Craig Udelman and he was talking about having a, a little study group where we talked in a nerdy way about uh, Berigovsky. Um and we thought that was a good idea and he said it would be really good if somebody did for some of the other volumes what Kurt Bjorling and Michael Alpert and uh, Mark Slobin had done for the Jewish instrumental book and and I suddenly thought I've got those books. I, I, I have these discs from uh, the Kiev library. And I went and looked at these Tish Nigunim and I thought, oh, Nigunim, well, you've got to sing those. And I thought, but the violin is the voice of the soul, you know, especially in the, oh. Jew <laughs> in the Jewish community, traditionally. Um, so maybe we could sing them on our violins. And because I'm, you know, lonely here in my lockdown, I thought I'll invite 34 of my closest violin playing friends around the world, plus some who I haven't met yet, like yourself. <laughs> and uh, we'll see if we can get through. And I reckon if there's 158 of them, there's 35 of us, that's five or six each, you know, give or take. Um, so the idea was to actually um, play some two people and allow them to interact. So the Ning and day. Um, meet your fiddler and uh, have an, a nigun at home and then for us to individually record each one so that we could then um, have an archive of the tunes sometimes with commentary sometimes without and we can match up the tunes with those recordings because we don't have access to most of the ones in the Vinatsky library unfortunately so it's a, a reference point for people if they want to actually hear the, the tunes being played or sung live and people are singing as well you've noticed probably which is nice. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> to hearing your, your contribution very soon. All right. We've also Jikas, and who else have we got here? We've got Eleanor, um, also part of the project. And we did have Lisa Gutkin, but she's gone now, I think, but she's also going to be playing for us. Exciting. Any other um, questions or comments? Yeah, Jika. Uh, I can't hear you. Shall I unmute you or can you unmute yourself? Whoops. Yeah. Um, yeah, so just the dates, you know, some of the nigun, nigunim um, that we were looking at, it says, um, oh, hang on, Lisa Gutkin wants to come back in. <laughs> says, um, so the date is, is something like 1913. So just, I'm a little confused. How did that, connect up with Berigovsky in his that sort of timeline because those are really early yes that was where, where do they come from and who collected them <coughs> they were connect, collected by Kieselhoff and Ansky he had all that mm -hmm. stuff in the archives um it sort of passed to him yeah. um at various different points it was sort of assembled in that and became one big archive so he went back and notated some of those and um, yeah more work on them yeah yeah and just while i'm unmuted um the other question this has obviously great similarity to any kind of traditional music which historically has not been written down is that when it's annotated it it can look i mean to be completely honest and it's like you know it becomes very one-dimensional when it's written down it doesn't convey all the subtleties and um, the nuances of that sort of live rendition of it. Mm. Um, so obviously that's our job is to kind of find that again. But I'm just wondering, um, do you think that, I mean, it, would, it must have been a struggle for him to keep really true to what he heard or what the recordings were. Because I, I can use an example of Scottish music, for example, where actually quite a lot of the um, original really rough kind of stuff was actually edited out. I, don't, I doubt Berigovsky did that because he was like an ethnomusicologist. 
but we have examples of quite a lot of classical, uh, sorry, um, traditional Scottish music that where it was kind of sanitized, it just became very, um, almost a little bit bland. And some of, those, some of those tunes can play a bit like that until you find how they might have been. Yeah, I think that's right. And because we know the genre, all the people in the project know the genre and they know yeah. on those tunes and they kind of feel them from the inside out. And um, he did actually, one of the chapters in his instrumental folk music book does talk a little bit about how he made the transcriptions and the <coughs> count. Um, for example, he did put the single tonality, he put everything in G. In the book, he did put, um, he did, uh, um, indicate the original tonalities of the pieces, um, which is interesting for us as instrumentalists, of course, but then in the other ones, uh, in the Nigman book, he didn't. So we can sing them or play them in any key. Um, so yeah, he does actually talk, talk about some of the uh, things that he did on page two, chapter two, page two and three. <laughs> and I think it was difficult for him. And sometimes you can see, I, I think the Tishnigan book, I get the feeling it was a bit special to him because he put some of his own stuff in, he record, put in some of his own recordings and some of the, you know, some places, for example, this one, he put like five different, um, you can't really see, but at the bottom, there's like five different, tiny, tiny variations that people could, that different performers did in the three informants that he had. Um, so he, he obviously cared a lot about what he was putting in and what he wasn't. And I think possibly it's like you say, when you write anything down, you assume on the part of the performer a certain amount of knowledge. And it's, uh, you know, I play Baroque music as well. And it's the same. You, you have to interpret the music off the page because there's no dynamics. There's generally no phrasing. But there was that sensibility at the time, which is what we argue about now, because of course, unlike with Klezmer, there's no recordings. Um, you know, they had a certain education, a certain way of doing things, and maybe that was different in different places, you know. Um, so all those same arguments apply really to its historical performance practice, basically, isn't it? <laughs> and is it an evolving tradition? You know, should we stick to the way they sounded on all those old recordings? Did they all really play in the same way if they lived in different places and different eras? Um, that's another discussion, possibly. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else wants to comment on that. Yeah, hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, I'm going to actually take the spotlight off myself, sorry. And stop. Yeah, I find this um, a really like interesting process to like read the tunes. And I, I, f I feel similar to, to Jika in certain ways. Like for me, it's like playing them over and over and over again until I get a sense of like, it's like getting to know almost a person like it's like just getting to pl like playing 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 them and then figuring out what they're saying where they're going sometimes it's odd like sometimes they don't quite make full sense and then yes we have like information coming from other places that we have because because we've played other tunes similar tunes or because oh this tiny thing reminds us of a gesture that's in chazones or whatever it is that um, just it's like little bits of information that we get from here and there and um, it's really fascinating and some like the the ones you you gave you assigned to me for, to to record there's one that the only information I have about is that it comes from a Henry to notes from a chazan and from a cantor and frankly I'm not sure what to do with this one it's like i i kind of understand it but i feel like maybe it's a fragment um i don't know and and i don't i mean i could record it just like in a sort of not definitive way at all like here's what's written here's what i get out of it but i i don't see how i could make it be a whole so this one I said, maybe I'm not going to record it. Maybe someone else will find more of a thing to it. And I'll stick to the ones that I feel that they're giving me 
I don't know. Yeah, that I can give them to, I mean, give back uh, yeah. some life in them more. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's really interesting because um, the pro, um, I didn't realize, but it's kind of like Klezmer 2.2. You know, when we started, everybody had to listen to the old recordings and learn from them. And there was no way you used music to learn tunes. You absolutely had to listen to an old recording and transcribe it and learn all the little nuances and stuff. And now we've got to the stage where actually we can throw those away. <laughs> we can't throw those away. I go back to them all the time. But at the same time, now we can approach these texts and bring the knowledge that we got from Klezmer 1.1 to these texts. And I, I'm really happy that we've got to this stage and yes, ask those questions. Is this actually, this is probably just a fragment. Do I just compose the rest of it or, <laughs> or do I give it to somebody else to do? And you know, I'm getting stuff back and other people are taking it and going, Oh, this is a great tune. I'm getting people saying, Oh, I had two tunes on one page and I want to do the other one. That's always a, a good one. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, it's a really interesting process. Um, and all these questions are coming up and I really appreciate the fact that we can chat about them and, and people ask the questions and throw the stuff around and do things with it or don't do things with it. Oh, I was just going to say, um, so the other thing, of course, is whatever interpretation we give them, it's completely leg legitimate to add something new because, um, you know, we're, we're not living then. We're not, in Russia, we're not there's we're not in that context at all, and I think that might be the other thing that makes them sound a little weird, is because you know I mean you could take uh, any kind of world folk tune, and if you were if some person an alien on another planet got it and played it over there, you know it might it would be out of context, <laughs> it, it would it might lose its meaning completely and so um all we can do is add something new to it i think that's completely fine and even that shifting from voice to fiddle there was a discussion you know i know that craig when craig was talking about keeping it as authentic and true as possible to as, as if it was your vocal voice which i understand i think that's i do understand but i also think when you, you we're playing it on a fiddle so it's going to be different and maybe that's fine to make it sound fiddle like so and then my fiddle like version is going to sound different from your fiddle like version because we each play differently so with each individual that's going to vary too and and in a way it's the kind of perhaps that's the um beauty of it in a way <laughs> Yeah, I agree. And I think um, there's, as soon as you use two strings, you're not doing what a vocalist would do. And certainly quite a lot of people have, have done things with double stopping and giving you an idea of um, what the chord might be, what they're thinking their tonality is in their head. And the other thing is that I think that uh, we talk about Klezmer having this, it's, bit, it's like music with a Yiddish accent. So it does sound different from music with a Scottish accent or music, you know, from other places. And that is, for me, as you know, when I thought of this project, I was hoping that everybody would come through with a Yiddish accent, no matter how much of their own personality they put in, they wouldn't change it into a, you know, German folk song or something like that, or a um, French, French central melody, putting in all those different ornaments and, so I think, you know, you're right, it is out of context, but at the same time, we're, take, we're bringing people to us. You know, every time we do a concert of klezmer music, certainly for me, I, I'm bringing people into that world and trying to teach them something about that world. Um, so we could say it's anachronistic and it's a bit weird, but on the other hand, we're doing it and we do bring some of our modern sensibility to it inevitably. Um, yeah. Hmm. Me? I speak. Okay. 
So um, I'm thinking about Berogovsky in Moscow in 1940, in the 1940s, as you know, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, 1944 he was in Moscow. Yeah, but he was there, he was around that area until 1948, which is of course exactly where our family history exists there. And I'm thinking about the Jewish population of Moscow at that time who used to come and talk to my father. What was going on there? Mm. You know, did he know about this? You know, there are all these family stories about this and it's precisely about locating it in time and place and then bringing it to 2020 or wherever we are now. So I'm thinking really hard about what people were doing, were, were doing with it at that particular time when I was a child and my father was a, was a European in a rather Asian place where people used to come up and talk to him mm. and say, you're a foreign Jew. Do you know about all these things? Just a bit of meditation on time and place. Okay. Yeah, he was a journalist. He was working for the, da uh, the Daily Worker in Moscow. But I think, I mean, I think that Berogovsky actually went back after 1944. He went back to um, Kiev and then he was collecting tunes in the Ukraine again uh, after that. So he didn't actually get back to Moscow as far as I'm aware after that. But yes, I, I understand what you're, what you're saying. Yeah. Mm. Other thoughts? Okay, so I just want to say that it's like a sort of fairy story coming true. You know, I've listened completely fascinated with this story of somebody going around just like, as you said, Alan Lomax or someone, or even Pete Seeger. He was the Pete Seeger of his, of his time and place. Um, it's really, it's really, really fascinating. Um, that he sort of took it out of its context and put it somewhere else, which I, th I think is really important. So you're not necessarily uh, thinking about little ladies in large wigs and guys with <laughs> guys with huge beards because we've brought it into the set into the 20th century. And I think that's really, really interesting. 21st century, excuse me. I think that's the most interesting part of it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I j just wanted to um, say a little bit about my sources, just because um, th there are some amazing materials out there. Um, the Klezmer book by Zev Feldman, Walter Zev Feldman, is um, an absolute goldmine of information. Uh, the Bjorling second edition of the Slobin uh, Jewish Instrumental Folk Music volume. Uh, various articles by um, by uh, Berogovsky's daughter, uh, Gerald Rubin's dissertation um, about klezmer music, and the Jeffrey Wallach article that I mentioned on the Soviet klezmer orchestra, um, also Gerald Rubin's album Shalom Comrade, um, and there are a few other dissertations and things that I found online that mentioned Berogovsky and had interviewed his descendants and such like. Oh, it's, there was so much going on when I started looking around, it was very difficult to condense it, but uh, so we've gone a quite a lot longer than half an hour I'm afraid but it's been very interesting thank you everybody for coming and I'm sorry that there was a little bit of trouble tomorrow we've got Olga um, Olga Baron broadcasting from London and uh, so it'll be the same time and I will attempt to get us all in at five o'clock um, thank you for coming today and do continue to turn up ask questions Chica oh I was just going to say thank you so much Ilana because it's been a, it's a really exciting project and I think if Barry Gofsky could thank you I, I know he would <laughs> yeah. if he was like I can just see him like looking over your shoulder thinking saying what is this zoom thing but whatever it is it's really working for me <laughs> well I found it very difficult to get a handle on his personality apart from <laughs> he played it's quite there's not much about him personally even you know yeah. 
him getting married or the birth of his daughter. Most of these treatises don't mention those things. They're all about his work and, you know, the polity. Yeah. Um, I'm looking forward to finding out a little bit more about that and uh, being able to yeah. feel a bit of the person behind this yeah. body of work. But I mean, if, if he could have known that somebody in 2020 would be doing this, you know, I bet he'd be, you know, absolutely delighted and that it's in the, it's, it's kind of through technology, it's, it's global as well. It's not just in an archive in Kiev. <laughs> it's quite amazing. Absolutely. And anyway, but th thank you very much. Thank you. And not one, not just one, but two projects going on at the same time about his work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, I will see you all anon and um, thanks again for coming and <laughs> tile version so we can see who's left <laughs> oh it's all the people from the project <laughs> i love it thanks very much i'm gonna head off thank you thank you